Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Um, I see a number of uh, familiar faces. Uh, we have quite a group tonight. Uh, a lot of folks uh, signed on. Um, I'll, I'll get kind of right to it. Um, as to our run of show, um, I'll make some introductory comments, and then we'll hear from uh, journalist Dick Hughes. Uh, de depending on the time, I might ask a question, but then squeeze in some of your questions and we'll do it by just raising hands. Um, so um, also I hope as a result of this uh, and tomorrow evening that you'll be inspired to join the State Public Policy Committee. Uh, it's really kind of fun. Um, one of our main tasks is to figure out what issues, ideas, et cetera we're gonna be uh, supporting or opposing in the legislature. So, and it's really a great committee. So make sure and email me if you have any interest whatsoever. Um, and the work burden isn't too much. So I'm gonna to start tonight uh, by recognizing that many of us uh, have a no way reaction when the topic of public policy making comes up, particularly in these divisive times. In fact, um, when I mention the trio of policymaking, policy, politics, excuse me, policymaking, politics, and partisanship, it's kind of like mentioning the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, but um, this reaction is complicated by the fact that, um, you know, as humans, we have this unfortunate tendency to search for, interpret, and recall information. Uh, in a way that conforms to our personal experiences and values. You know, it's kind of like we rely on facts, others are swayed by politics and partisanship. Uh, the challenge is really not just to find the answers or solutions to problems, um, but what are the questions in the first place? Uh, of course, making decisions in this manner may be more easy. You know, do we really have time to assess danger when uh, facing a grizzly bear in the woods? But, you know, let's face it, we like to be right and be around others who think like us. But tonight we'll be talking about policymaking, politics, and partisanship. Um, in terms of what AEW, that is national AEW, is all about, um, did I think there's some words, Nancy, do you have that screenshot? This came from, uh, uh, you know, something that I, uh, it's a screenshot. So what the official line is, um, and we all try to live it um, from national to state, we're nonpartisan, but we've always been political. That means we endorse legislation, we take political stands, we influence legislative deb debate, and we work with and you know, converse with any policymaker um, who cares about our priority issues. So you know, we define our goals and our priority issues and go from there. So thank you. Um, so it would seem to me in this kind of fact, policymaking partisanship, the first step um, in trying to manage this dilemma is learning from someone who has a lot of on the scene experience in Oregon's policymaking process. That's Dick Hughes. Um, he's covered the Oregon political scene on and off since uh, 1976. He's a longtime editorial page editor of the Statesman Journal in Salem, he has been a freelance journalist since 2016. Um, he writes the weekly uh, Capital Chatter column about state government and politics for Oregon Capital Insider, which I recommend to you. I really enjoy reading it. Uh, and a couple of other facts I just can't resist. Um, his journalistic life started when he helped edit and mimeograph, remember that? The lone edition of the sixth grade newspaper. He hit the big time when his story about the chess club ran in the junior high newspaper. Yeehaw. <laughs> anyway, from there, it was on to the McMinnville uh, News Register, Statesman Journal, USA Today. He's won a number of state, regional, and national journalism awards and says, of course, he has no idea where he put them. And one final really important factor, his wife, Rochelle, has also been an AUW member. So, Dick, what do you have to say about this policymaking, uh, you know, partisanship, politics? Away you go. Well, thank you uh, very much. One thing I didn't tell you 
uh, was that I've been nominated three times for the Pulitzer Prize. Please give me a standing ovation. Now, the secret is, that sounds really impressive, right? Anybody can be nominated. The last time I did it was after I got laid off. And so I nominated myself. And the reason I mention that is, there are a lot of things you will hear from the legislature uh, and from legislators that sound very impressive. But when you look behind the scenes, eh, they're not that impressive. So I use myself as an example. Um, but anyway, when I was a kid, there was a short-lived TV series called Slattery's People. Have any of you heard of that at all? Doesn't ring a bell. Uh, it was about a state legislator. Uh, maybe that's why it was short-lived. Uh, one of the co-stars was a guy you might have heard of named Ed Asner. That was before he became Lou Grant. That's how long ago it was. Um, I don't remember anything about the program, uh, except that every episode started with these words. Democracy is a very bad form of government. But I ask you never to forget, all the others are so much worse. That, of course, is a play on a famous quotation by Winston Churchill. And it left a lifelong impression on me. Despite its messiness and its increasing nastiness, democracy needs our attention and it needs our active care and feeding. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Even though it's Zoom, I look forward to our learning together. I hope that some things that we talk about tonight will cause you particularly to question some assumptions. And I hope some things will cause you to ask questions um, of legislators tomorrow night. You're going to get to hear from some very smart and talented people. And I hope they will disagree uh, from about some of the things that are said tonight. Uh, many people see the world, especially politics, as black and white. Uh, journalists, however, live in a world of gray. Uh, we, or at least I, believe that the, uh, truth emerges from the collision of ideas. Uh, almost every issue has multiple sides and is far more nuanced uh, than is described in legislative press releases in floor speeches, let alone news coverage. Um, and certainly of all the issues being discovered, the major issues being dis discussed in the current session, that's true. And we can talk about some of those later if you'd like. But as a journalist, if I can do my part to help Oregonians better understand each other, I will have done my little part for democracy. So, um, I welcome your questions and thoughts, whether as we go along or at the end, however you'd like to do that. So let's get going. Recently, I had a talk with a veteran legislator about a number of issues. And as we were chatting, he mused about life as a legislator. And he, he said, you're always caught between your conscious, conscience, your caucus, and your constituents. As a legislator, you're always caught between your conscience, your conscious, your conscience, your caucus, and your constituents. That seems a very appropriate summation of what we're contemplating this evening: the interplay of politics, policy making, and partisanship. An effective legislature, it seems to me, makes decisions on a continuum, or perhaps intersection would be a better word, of all those. Uh, weighing the, the trade-offs, because no bill is perfect. Uh, so the legislature must consider uh, something that the public and the interest groups don't always look at to what extent the good outweighs the bad and vice versa. And if a legislator, whether on the right or the left, if you like to use those labels, um, they could be helpful, but they're imperfect. 
a, a legislator who's unbending in the ideology rarely accomplish, accomplishes anything of note. As for constituents, legislators must please enough constituents that um, if they won't re want to remain in office, they won't draw a strong opponent in their party primary election. And remaining in office is a high consideration of many politicians. You might have noticed that. Any of you noticed that? Thank you. I appreciate the amen. I've often thought, and many politicians disagree with me, uh, that a true statesman or stateswoman is someone who's willing to lose an election. And the only person in all public office I've ever met who, who was willing to avoid going negative is Peter Courtney and was willing to give up an election. Now, there are probably others, but he's the only one I personally know of. And in that case, Kate Brown, who was Senate Majority Leader, went negative on his behalf in order to ensure his reelection. But anyway, uh, in addition, constituents, especially the demographics of constituents most likely to vote in party primaries tend to be ideological. And surveys, surveys can confirm that. There are optimistic surveys that imply that Oregonians want politicians to collaborate for the common good, but unfortunately, that doesn't actually seem to be the case. Which brings us to the role of legislative caucuses, which covers all three of the intersecting points we've been talking about. So I'll talk, uh, I'll focus on them for just a, a moment. There are now are five caucuses in the Oregon legislature, House Democrats, House Republicans, some Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans, which I know are four, despite my limited math skills. Um, the state legislative budget provides staffing for those offices. By the way, the House caucuses are larger than their Senate counterparts, but the House caucuses are much more internally cohesive uh, than the, their Senate counterparts who are kind of fractured ideologically. Now, there also are two senators who caucus together as independents. They're the fifth caucus. They don't have staff. Peter Courtney wouldn't give them staff. They have tried. So those are the five caucuses. Everything about the legislature and politics is the sum of pluses and minuses. That's true for the caucuses. Covering the legislature was an eye opener for me when I first started doing it full time in the 80s. For one, I expected to really like the legislators with whom I had agreed ideologically. I found that often wasn't the case. The legislators I liked were the ones whom, whose word was good, the ones who wanna you know, tell me one thing and do something else. Turns out character and integrity are so much more important than ideology. In addition, as a journalist, I'm a journalist. I know a little about a whole lot of things. In contrast, most legislators are specialists. That was a surprise to me when I started covering the legislature. They know a lot about a few subjects, but typically are lost outside their areas of expertise. Some don't even read bills until the bills are in front of them before a floor vote. If then, they depend upon information from their caucuses on how to vote. Caucuses regularly meet to go over bills and discuss caucus positions on certain major bills, where they want people to vote one way or the other. Unlike in some states, such as Arizona, which is more forward thinking than Oregon on this, Oregon caucus meetings are private to the chagrin of Oregon journalists. Uh, our legislature has exempted itself from certain public meetings and public records laws uh, that apply itself elsewhere in our state government. By the way, uh, for those of you in Lane County, uh, Representative Mary, Mary, Marty Wilde of the Eugene decided not to caucus with his fellow Democrats 
this session or with Republicans either. Um, he's had a sometimes testy relationship with his caucus as he's pushed uh, oversight recommendations and open government recommendations that others have not gone along with. He also said it's not appropriate for a majority of lawmakers in the House, in this case, the supermajority Democrats, to be meeting in private while making decisions that affect uh, Oregonians as a whole. Another downside is the caucus's faster partisanship and short-term solutions. It's all about winning. It's all about promoting the caucus agenda and showcasing their members. Now, uh, a brief uh, interjection here. I'm big on the Oregon legislature. Compared to a lot of states, we've got it good, okay? So, but I also will point out the flaws because I think it's important to know those. Uh, a small example of the downside from this afternoon. The Oregon Senate Democrats sent out a press release headline, Senate Democrats protect bakery workers from unfair workplace practices. It was about Senate Bill 1513, a bipartisan measure that passed 24 to two today. The release quoted two Democratic senators, no Republicans. The release did not include the fact that seven Republicans were among the 24 senators voting for the bill. How do we correct that or change that if we do? I would suggest that Democrats contact the Senate Democratic Caucus and say, hey, next time, give a nod to the Republicans. You know, we can only change the people on our side. We can't change the other side. Oh, and a side note, in Oregon, unlike in some states, uh, we in the press generally don't bother publishing the, uh, the partisan one-sided press releases that spew forth from legislators. You know, um, there's a lot of partisanship that goes, uh, that goes on that we just, yeah. So another example of caucuses, and it happens on both sides. You know, in this case, I've noted the Democrats, but it happens on all sides. Another example of caucuses and typical partisanship came Wednesday morning when the House and Senate Revenue Committees met uh, through video conference to hear the quarterly economic and state revenue forecast, which can be a big deal. At 8.02, the state economists began talking, and they are two of the funniest state economists I've ever encountered, uh, besides being bright. But during the next 45 minutes, the House and Senate Democratic leaders and the Senate Republican leaders released statements saying how the extra money should be spent. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, what extra money? Ah, then, <coughs> excuse me, at 8.47, the economists finally got to the bottom line. There was extra money. The legislature will have $800 million more to spend during the current two-year budget period than was projected just three months ago. But legislative leaders who, know, who knew what was going to be in the forecast already had their talking points and their statement plans. They followed along partisan lines, and so did the other politicians' responses throughout the day. Not surprising. But what saddened me as I listened throughout the 90 minute meeting, and they're good people on this committee, smart people, you know, I don't have a bad thing to say about any of them. I was struck that no legislator, regardless of party, asked how economic conditions were affecting the other side's constituencies and thus how to help them. No legislator, regardless of party, asked how the revenue might be used to help the other party's constituencies. Each party was only looking out for its own. This process we have in the legislature leads to short-term solutions i.e. wins in the legislature that while supposedly benefiting Oregonians, 
also will help that particular party and its candidates at the next election. Oregon is better off than many states in that it operates on a two-year budget cycle instead of one. But even two years does not equal long-range planning. And our state constitution does not allow a current legislature to bind future legislatures to specific policies or spending. Only voters can do that through constitutional amendments, which is why the Oregon constitution is so insipidly convoluted and ridiculously long compared with the US constitution. And if you wanna know what I really think about that, I'll be glad to tell you. Again, our system is built for short-term responses, dealing with the symptoms of a problem instead of curing the disease. Take homelessness, which polling identifies as the number one issue for Oregonians. Yet I can't recall any rally being held at the Capitol to take on homelessness. Lots of other issues by various constituencies, but who's rallying to take on homelessness? Since at least Ted Kulongoski's tenure as governor, Oregon has had lofty 10 years, 10 year plans for confronting homelessness. Yet there are homeless individuals sleeping on sidewalks within mere blocks of the Capitol and throughout your communities, I'm sure. Homeless individuals have died outside state buildings on the Capitol Mall. And as AUW of Oregon noted in testimony supporting House Bill, 4013 this year, Oregon's record of supporting homeless youth is abysmal. Oregon is not unique. Our daughter's a high school counselor. Her heart aches for kids who have no way to do their homework because they lack not only internet connections, but electricity, water, and other things. I'm, that's as much as I could say without tearing up. And as parents, we provide as much support to her as we can. Former Governor John Kitzhaber suggested to solve such chronic problems and to build a better Oregon for all of us in every part of the state, we must develop a clear vision that looks out at least 10 years. We must identify the several interlocking issues that will define our state's physical, mental, educational, economic, social, and environmental health. Then we must commit to addressing the long-term root causes instead of applying more band-aids every one or two years. Kitzhaber's analysis and answer make absolute sense, but they require willpower. They will require us to develop a common narrative where people understand one another's story. Storytelling is the most powerful form of communication. It's a cliche, but we all have much more in common than what separates us, but we focus on that which separates us. And it will require the courage to put aside long, put aside short term personal and partisan gains in order to achieve the longer term common good. And it will require often current leaders to step aside so younger and marginalized people can take their place. We all want to encourage others to step forward and be leaders, but it's happened in the Oregon House when it elected a new House Speaker. This session, oh, not yet. It's not yet time for a person of color to, to ascend to be Speaker. Just wait your turn. I encourage all of us to join Kitzhaber and others, regardless of party and geography, who are striving to rebuild, strengthen, and lengthen the statewide collaborative efforts that used to be known as the Oregon Way. That sounds like the end of my talk, but it's a false summit. We're going to keep going. In fact, let's back up for a moment. Currently, the legislature remains locked in band-aids. So legislators must use the bandage as best they can. One is legislative work groups, which I know sounds like anathema to many folks. Believe me, they're better than their predecessor. For de decades, if lawmakers couldn't find agreement on a thorny issue during a legislative session, they would punt. They would create a task force to study it and make recommendations. 
many a bookshelf has been lined with those reports. And I'm sure they're, sure they're doing a great job of holding those bookshelves in place. They might have achieved a few results. Uh, none come to mind, but I'm sure there were some results. And a task force still has value. Certain instances, they're open to the public. Uh, they're more cache than a work group. Uh, however, in recent, there's been a shift from a step in recent years, there's been a shift from establishing task forces, which take time to formally create, have, limber, have limited uh, number of members and cost $10,000 to $20,000 to staff and run. Uh, to instead putting together informal work groups, which can be created quickly by a committee chair at little or no cost and with whatever uh, broad range of participation is appropriate. The idea is simply to get divergent stakeholders together to try to work out key differences and agree as much as possible on legislation, if any, to introduce in the next legislative session. This also happens during legislative sessions. You know, try to resolve differences. I asked a veteran legislator what makes for an effective work group. Quote, I would say that a good work group is one with a clear purpose, ideally a shared purpose. Members who are empowered to be frank about problems, who are creative and flexible, who are truly committed to problem solving, and not just maintaining the status quo. In most cases, not everyone is going to fit that description. So it's, criti cru so it's crucial that you have a chair who is able to get the right people in the room and act in a way that gets them to trust the process. Even more important is to have good staff shepherding the process. Again, the great flaw with work groups, of course, is that they're out of the public eye. And that also, is the flaw in the legislative process. Votes take place in public, but discussion and deals often happen behind closed doors. Whether in caucuses or among legislative leadership or in hallways between committee members. And yeah, there's a lot of partisanship, but on the other hand, it's such an improvement compared with uh, Congress, the legislative policy offices, the legal office, the revenue office, the uh, fiscal budget office are all nonpartisan. Uh, they work for all, they work, they, in a sense, they're under the control of the mar, uh, majority parties, but they're run by bar, bipartisan committees. Uh, legislators sit side by side, not segregated by party on their committees. Um, there are downsides. Um, ever since Oregon toughened its uh, lobbying rules, lobbyists can't hold as many parties, legislators don't get to know each other as much. They don't hang out together as much. It's become more of a eight to five uh, workday. And so, you know, it's really difficult to hate someone you socialize with. And there's less socializing. That's true in Congress. You know, now that they have a shorter work week and people go home on the weekends instead of hanging around or doing things together as families. Any, anyway, here I'm getting to the conclusion. So ready your questions. It is the people's legislature. It's worth being involved. AAUW has had a stake on the, at the table. I, I think that's really important. It may not make a difference at times, but it makes a difference if AAUW isn't there. That's incredibly important. You're noticed if you're not there. So I have eight tips for you. And because I'm so wise, I know you will want to memorize and instantly act on them. But please keep listening before running out to act on them. One is testify at the legislature. Pick an issue and dig in. Pick on pick something that's close to your heart, your heart and tell your story. Personal stories and facts move legislators. Be concise and thoughtful. You'll be most effective 
when testifying on bills that are out of the limelight, instead of being one person among hundreds of people waiting to testify in person or in writing, there's so much repetition on major bills. And people think that their testimony will change minds. It's, it won't. Rarely does a floor speech change minds either, by the way. Maybe a handful of times across a dec decade, you know, but people talk anyway. Practice your testimony. Be prepared for a two or three minute time limit. Don't take it personally if a hearing runs out before you're called. Three, be politely persistent. Courtesy pays off. Demanding attention does not. Brevity is a virtue. Call and write legislators to encourage a specific action, such as a specific change to a bill or passage of a bill as is. Don't waste your time as on generalities. Uh, please be supportive of bills uh, that improve uh, education. Great. And uh, motherhood and apple pie and whatever. Unless, of course, they support journalism. Uh, four, pay attention to issues beyond the legislature. Five, defy the pollsters. And I don't mean lie to pollsters when they call. I'm always intrigued when we get a pollster call in our home trying to figure out who the poll's for. Sur surveys suggest that only a small minority of Oregonians regularly gather and converse with friends whose views and even values differ from their own. That amazes me. Life is a lot more fun when you when you hang out with people unlike yourself. I've always done that, you know. Six, set a good example for yourself. Um, resist any urge to post memes, et cetera, that make fun of the other side. They're not all idiots, regardless of what your friends may think. Seven, subscribe to your local newspaper whether in print or online, doesn't matter to me. All my subscriptions, of which I have many, are online. Um, but local news really matters. Eight, every day, read and absorb something that challenges your opinion. I think that's so much more important than reading things that, with which you agree. Um, and that's all I've got. Well, Thank you so very much. Wow, uh, that that's a lot. Um, uh, I really appreciate your uh, analysis, and I recognize it um, quite well. I get I get one question, then we can kind of open it up um, for everybody. One of the reasons, actually, there are several articles that you've written that um, that have intrigued me. Um, but one that you wrote recently, which I think applies to the topic we're talking about, um, you know, trying to put the Oregon way, at, at least as we perceive the collaborative approach, um, but uh, uh, firearms and the, uh, the safe storage bill that was passed in the previous session. Um, Obviously, there are uh, there is some disagreement among uh, citizens of the state of Oregon about firearms and what should be done and what shouldn't. Um, and it definitely seems to me to be this, you know, like, you know, come together and it just won't, it won't uh, go anywhere. So safe storage bill, was that a good example of the Oregon way or is it another example of Something else. Um, let me use an even, I don't think it's a good example of the Oregon way. All right. I agree. Um, In fact, the opposite. Let, yeah. Uh, let me use uh, a, a, a national issue, abortion. <clears throat> uh, think how much money is spent on abortion rights and opposing abortion rights. And I'm not saying that those campaigns are wrong, but think how much, mo if that much of that money were spent on helping people receive prenatal care, on uh, birth control, 
on helping people become good parents, uh, whatever aspect you wanted to, to do, you know. And Mary Cunningham uh, created years ago created a foundation to do that in Boise. That's an example of coming together, trying to unite the two sides. Um, with safe storage, coming together would have been getting the NRA and uh, Mother's Demand Action coming together, like on an educational campaign to encourage safe storage, which I absolutely believe in. You know, it's it's that type of thing. And and if they want to pursue legislation, you know, it's like our 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 church had a presentation from Mother's Demand Action. Um, I'm not a gun owner. Uh, I don't want any guns. But so years ago, I went through a gun training course, so I understood guns. You know, and I think it's important to understand the other side. And I would have liked to have our church co hosted a presentation on why people who want to have instant access to guns. So you understand the other side rather than trying to convince them, if that makes sense. Yes, I thought I, I, it does make sense. Um, I think a very, <clears throat> excuse me, profound sense. And the reason I asked you that um, example is what you were saying is, you know, particularly because safe storage, there are major challenges in enforcement. Like you have to go into their home, uh, presumably, to see if yeah. they're safely stored, at least the way the bill is written. So what did that do? It um, Those who are, you know, in favor of, I'll say, gun control, they're like, okay, boy, we got that bill passed. Um, score one for our side. But then on the other side, um, folks who are against uh, firearms control say, look what they passed. The kind of bill that they passed is the one that, that gets into our home. So what you, what you talk about is, hey, imagine if all the sides of the uh, gun debate actually you know, got together to deal with what everybody recognizes are problems, suicide prevention, you know, violence, mass shootings, et cetera. There's some agreement on those, on those aspects. Imagine if you could get people together to uh, talk about that and their perspectives. So, and that example you just gave us a good one as well. So um, questions. Um, the, the, yes. Some people have raised hands and there's some in the chat too. I see that. So um, I'll, I'll let, but I'll let you deal. All right. Those. I'm going to, I'm going to start with Barbara Gaines. I see her hand is up. Barbara? Oh, you're on mute, Barbara. I did on mute, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm having a bit of a struggle with whether you are in the two examples you gave in with guns and abortion, if you're thinking we need a different framework or if we need to parcel it out differently. Uh, one seems a much larger attack or proposal to accommodate. And the other seems to try to compartmentalize in some ways. And I think, I, I mean, I think there's probably merit for either approach, but I just didn't quite understand what you were both proposing. I, I, thank you. Um, I, I will avoid what uh, many people testifying before the legislature. Uh, well, thank you, uh, uh, Senator so and so, for that very good question. You know, which always drives me crazy as they're trying to play to people. But but it is a very it is a good question. I didn't explain it well. Um, I think the point is, where can you find common ground? That's where you where you start with. Um, okay, we want to reduce the number of abortions regardless whether people want to keep them legal or people want to ban them. So what can we do to reduce the number, okay? And, and that's a big issue that we, you know, so guns, gun safety and preventing suicides is where we'll probably find more common ground. Okay, how can we uh, reduce firearm, firearm deaths? 
where the leading cause is suicide. Mm -hmm. And some people who testify to the legislature said, well, if somebody wants to commit suicide with a gun, that's their right. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's an extreme view. There are extreme views on either side. Okay, I want to try to find common ground with that person. But how can we work together? Okay, and it may be a different group, you know, how do we find mental ground? And often it has to be on a community basis, you know, like some of the forestry projects or whatever it may be. We can agree on this and start here. You know. Uh, you're on, Trish, you're on mute. Yep, thank you. Um, Barbara, I don't know if that fully answered uh, what you were trying to say, but uh, Anyway, I'm going to I'm going to call on Joe Rossman and at the end, maybe we can uh, tie this up a little bit in terms of how I see what what Dick is saying. Joe Rossman. Hi, thank you. Um, thinking about your description of the caucuses and how they determine legislators approach to bills coming in and their votes on it. How do you see the change in leadership this year, oh. given retirement and people leaving for elections? Yeah. How is that changing the whole feel for the legislature this year? That's a, a very good question, and I anticipated it, and I don't have a good answer. <laughs> uh, I have not been at the Capitol um, uh, for a variety of reasons. One is that I'm still recovering from a breakthrough case of COVID from last fall that's left me with long COVID, shall we say. Um, so I haven't been as mobile. Um, there has been a feeling of relief in the house um, that things are not as angry as they have been. But on the other hand, the minority Republicans have very few ways of exerting um, influence. And so they're asking the bills be read word for word right you know and the senate republicans did that on one bill today so um on the one hand you've got some an opportunity uh to rebuild bridges on the other hand you have people who aren't as experienced so i don't know how it's going to turn out and as I've talked some with people, you know, it's kind of in between. And I've not been there to watch the body language on the floor sessions. And since all the committee sessions are virtual, you can't, that's the downside of virtual sessions. I had thought it'd be great if more committee sessions were online, because, you know, as to reduce energy consumption of legislators driving to the Capitol, but you really lose a lot because you can't read legislators, you know, reacting to testimony. So I don't know. And I'm sorry, I can't, but that's an honest answer. Can I ask one follow through to that? Sure. From, from my limited perspective, from way away from the Capitol building, I happen to live in rural Yamhill County. I would guess that having Betsy Johnson gone would take a lot of strong opinion and um, strong language out of the legislature. Do you see any effect from her being gone as an individual? I think it's a huge loss for the legislature. Um, Betsy is a brilliant politician. Um, she, she she worked quite well with her Senate co-chair, Elizabeth Steiner Hayward, um, on these and means, and uh, Elizabeth is, is quite liberal. Um, and Betsy can work well with people. Um, and on procedural bills, she, on procedural issues, she stuck with her Democratic caucus all the way, which enabled her to then 
not stick with the Democratic caucus on a lot of policy bills. Um, but people respected her intellect, her independence, and her willingness to dig into issues. She asked the, que the questions in budget meetings that everyone should be asked, asking about how's this money going to be spent. So I think it's a huge loss, regardless of whether people like her politics or not. Okay. Okay. Thank Good you. Good questions. Good questions, Barbara and Joe. Sarah Meyer. Hi, I come from Astoria, and our AEW branch has opted for many years to stay very local focused. And you're talking about groups getting together to discuss issues. We find that intimidating to even start some of those kind of conversations that we might intellectually want to do. Um, and you're saying just start doing it, which I think is great, but the, the factions are so darn divided and there's some hate there that, that is kind of fearful for people who don't understand that. And I'd like to have just a little bit more thoughts on your part of how you actually get it going. Wow, that's a, a great question. Um, at age 60, I went back to school while working full time, plus teaching, got a master's in management simply because I wanted to be better uh, as an editor. And the last course I took was in small group dynamics, and I'm glad I did. And what I would suggest is start small, find something where you probably can find some type of agreement. The route for a local trail, even though that could be divisive, or something where you can get to know each other and build relationships. Start really, really small. Start local, where you can listen to each other, where every person's input is valued, where no person dominates, and with a good leader who makes sure that everybody is involved in the conversation. And with a leader who is not vested in a, getting a specific decision where consensus becomes more important than a specific outcome. And when you build trust, you build relationships, then you can move on to other things. People want to be heard. And that's what's often lacking at the legislature. People testify, and like at the um, agricultural overtime hearing, they, scores of people testified, but there was no time for legislators to respond, so nobody knew whether they were heard. I mean, whether legislators really got it. And so the more within your group, that people can talk and feel like that you and others heard what they were saying. And it may be worth spending some time. And there are organizations that, that do this work um, in a way that's not um, touchy-feely, which just drives me crazy, um, about collective listening and how to listen and reflect back in ways that are not offensive and um, Portland State uh, University has a center that does that. That could be helpful. We all need to do that. Listening is the most important skill. It's the most important skill for, for journalists. And it's not taught in journalism school. Of course, I only took one class in journalism school. And so I hope that helps. Well, I, um, by the way, I think the reference in case uh, folks didn't catch it, um, it was to House Bill 4002, which is the bill that um, required uh, farm workers who work overtime to be paid, you know, overtime pay. Um, that, that bill has been in, through an interesting history, but um, I think at this point, uh, everybody, the uh, Democrats and the Republicans realize that there's a whole lot of money out there to be spent. So no one wants to walk out. <laughs> um, so um, I think that that bill was one of the bills that could potentially have caused a walkout. 
The other is the, um, which is not gonna proceed in the legislature, which is incarcerated individuals being um, uh, given the right to vote. But I'd like to ask, since I don't see a, although is the, is the uh, coast another, is there a coastal caucus? There, there are individual caucuses like that. There's a coastal caucus, there's a health provider caucus and things like that. If you're asking in the legislature, all sorts of, there's a sportsman's caucus and is sports not, you know, including sports women. Uh, there's a craft beer caucus, um, but they don't have staff. Do you ever see a value to either politics or partisanship? Or is it just all basically, uh, you know, placing spanners in the works kind of thing? Oh, yeah. The problem with politics is it's political. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I mean, it's about wins and losses, but yeah, would you rather live in a, a benevolent dictatorship that's not really benevolent or a monarchy? I mean, we have a chance to influence things. The problem is so much of local politics is, is dictated by the national climate. And what we can do is at the margins, but that's why it's so important in Oregon to act at the at the margins, uh, and and one uh, one on one try to improve the climate. You know, there are lots of I mean, there are lots of stories. Um, I've heard from readers in my column of how they've gotten to know somebody who disagrees with them, and how that relationship has fostered and it, it wasn't deliberate, you know, like somebody had a flat tire and they got to know the person and then they, and by helping them and then they got to know their issues and they have a different outlook on that issue and can talk about that constructively. Um, and partisanship is, yeah, believe in, this is what's right for our country. This is what's right for our state. These are the principles we hold to. Um, I'm essentially a nonpartisan person. Um, I'm registered as a Republican. My wife is registered as a Democrat. That way I get all the campaign materials for both parties, which is helpful to me as a journalist. I mean, I'm definitely a, a rhino, a Republican in name only. <laughs> well, um... Don't you think that most legislators make an incredible effort to become informed about issues and, um, you know, attempt to do the best that they can uh, after studying the various issues? I, I think the issues in which they're interested. Mm -hmm. Most do some the quality of legislators varies a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I look at some legislators' newsletters and it sounds like the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm going, huh? And they take credit for all these things. And others you may never hear a peep from publicly and they're doing amazing work behind the scenes. How can we, how can we um, determine that? Um, that's that's something I've asked people a lot. One is ask local leaders what they think of their legislator and for the community. Uh, ask legislators specifically, what did you do about this? How did it happen? Observe them in committees uh, and recognize that different parties have different views. Several years ago, um, a, a new legislator remark to um, from a new Democratic legislator, re remark to a Democratic, or excuse me, a Republican legislator, is that this session going great? And the Republican was just surprised because to the Democrat, it was great. All the Democratic bills were getting passed. To the Republican, no, it was awful. Her party was getting steamrolled. 
And the Democrat didn't understand why the difference. In perspective. And so it's helpful to understand the perspective that it's not just partisanship. Um, and yeah, I think most legislators work really hard, really care. And one aspect of that we haven't talked about that's incredibly important is constituent service. And if you ever need help in dealing with a state agency, don't hesitate to contact your legislator because that's incredibly important. Um, you know, Mark Hatfield, Darlene Hatfield, uh, Darlene Hooley, uh, Ron Wyden, all were, are or were incredibly skilled at constituent service. And that's, that's something that, uh, and I, you know, I've gone through Mark Hadfield for help with my mother-in-law's dealing with Medicare, and it was invaluable. Right. I see we have a couple of questions. Monica. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so um, pre-retirement, I had several jobs where it was part of my job to testify before the legislature or work behind the, scene, behind the scenes with legislators. Um, and uh, probably the most important bill that I worked on was actually to kill it. And so we talk about um, testifying before the legislature to get bills passed or working or, or going and lobbying to get bills passed. But sometimes it's really important to kill a bill. And so, because that bill will cause harm to the interests. And so um, I wonder um, what your, if you have a sense of um, how many bills it's important to kill versus get passed, how, how people are working on these ratios in Oregon. I've been here for a decade, but I haven't worked with the legislature here. So do you understand my question? <laughs> No, yeah, no, and I think you make a, a, a good point. About th roughly 3,000 bills are um, introduced during a long legislative session, which happens in odd, num odd numbered years. About 800 will pass. And by the way, 90% of the bills that, that pass are with bipartisan votes um, because most bills are not controversial. Um, but so most bills fall by the wayside and and it is important to kill some bills either because there's a really stupid flaw in them that nobody's noticed and people may say oh let's just pass it and we'll fix it next time and part of the reason for these short sessions in in even numbered years is what they call technical fixes. In other words, oops, we messed up. And that happens, you know? I mean, I'm not criticizing the legislature. We all learn, you know, there are unexpected consequences. Um, and so it is very important. And that's where uh, not going overboard, but rationally explaining this is why this bill is bad. Here's a better solution. Um, instead of the, not the sky is falling, but you know, making a good rational argument for it. Bills to pass sometimes it's both the the personal story. It's much more of the rational argument why this bill is bad. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and it was also important that the person personal story wasn't personal it was li for libraries library district so the bill in question would have taken um property away from library districts and put it back in the general fund county coffers instead of protected funding for libraries so and that happens all 
all the time in Oregon with education service districts and other things. And those are the things the public, you know, the public doesn't pay much attention to. But that's where AAUW and other organizations can really have an effect by paying attention to these arcane issues that really matter. Yeah, right, right. I like that. Suzanne. I'm curious as to whether or not it, we would have a much more effective legislature if they had long sessions all the time and not, not the long and the short. Um, some people think that. People who on the Democratic side think that. Uh, because it's a, it's a question of government is the answer to versus government should stay out of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, I asked the House Speaker uh, whether the pay raise for legislators bill was a move toward a more permanent legislative session. And he said, no, it wasn't. But that's that's very much a partisan issue, I think. And there are pros and cons to it. Yeah. Just as there are to most major bills. Okay. Um, it may be that this is related, and I'm not exactly sure. But Kate um, asked a question in the chat. Um, you had indicated that our legislature is a citizen legislature. And she had heard that there's some discussion about changing that. Could you speak to that issue? Yeah, um, there's uh, the issue of paying legislators uh, a family wage, which um, would be about, I don't remember the, uh, the numbers off the top of my head. Well, I think about $57,000 a year plus 1000 dollars a month child allowance uh, for legislators who have kids uh, under age 13. And this is a perfect example of pros and cons. This would allow uh, more people to run for office because currently you essentially have to have another job, be independently wealthy or have a, a family member who can support you uh, support your family uh, while you serve in the legislature. And that tends to skew the legislature toward older folks, retired folks, wealthier folks, okay? So there's a lot of value in that. On the other hand, there's a lot of value in having people who have outside jobs. I think the legislature will be much healthier if there were more Democrats with in it with a business background and more Republicans with a public sector background. Uh, and that would reduce some of the disharmony within the legislature. And you get those backgrounds by people having outside jobs. So that's an example of, of pluses and minuses. Now, um, does that mean that that a higher wage is a long way to go? Not necessarily. It's just those are the types of things that need to be considered among the pros and cons. Um, I have uh, two questions, um, or maybe a question and a comment. Um, what do you think the role of media is in um, fostering uh, collaboration? Oh wow! I'm, I'm, I'm. There's a bit of irony in that question. I'm sure you could hear. Wow, there's so many ways to go with that. So I'll try to not go overboard. In my personal view, that's sort of what I see as part of my role. I currently write a quasi opinion column um, for EO Media Group and Pamphlet Media. EO Media Group produces a quarterly magazine called The Other Oregon, which I've done some writing for. <laughs> and the purpose of the, that magazine is to educate urban Oregonians about rural Oregon. 
And I think that's incredibly important. Um, the, there have been collaborations about among Oregon media to do similar projects, uh, to collaboratively cover the governor's race and do other things to cover issues. And I think that's really good. On the other hand, there are hardly any media covering the Capitol anymore. There, there are more than there were two years ago, uh, but it's, but it's, but it's unfortunate. Like there, uh, TV stations aren't there every day as they were when I started in the eighties. Um, the Oregonian doesn't have multiple uh, reporters there every day as it did in the eighties. On the other hand, uh, OPB has really beefed up its coverage. Um, and there are new entries on the block uh, with the Oregon Capital Insider, the Oregon Capital Chronicle, and others. And I think media tend to thrive on conflict, which is, I think, is unfortunate. Um, some, some journalists are not as experienced. Uh, so they have a ways to learn. On the other hand, you've got some of the most veteran journalists in Oregon covering the Capitol. Peter Wong, who when he and he was in a meeting with Kitzhaber, Kitzhaber said something and Peter said, Governor, I think you have the wrong date. It was such and such. And Kitzhaber said to him, well, Peter, I'm sure you're right, if that's what you think. <laughs> I mean, that's encyclopedia. Gary Warner, who's an amazing guy, writes for the Ben Bulletin. Um, you know, I'm second longest in tenure next to, to Peter. So people have been around. Um, I, I'm sure people are <clears throat> kind of wanting to wind up. I have, I have one final question for you. Um, I'm going to ask you to imagine that you just got elected to the uh, House of Representatives. And, you know, you talk about the Oregon way, you talk about collaboration. I have a feeling there are a lot of legislators who run um, from good heart, from wanting to uh, learn and as a result of that learning, hopefully solve some problems and issues which they see. Um, but how then would you, as a um, young legislator, um, collaborate? The, the, uh, the problem is people who are centrist and get sidelined by their caucuses. Um, that happened to Brian Clem in Salem. Uh, that happened to some of the Republicans. Um, that, you know, Republicans and Democrats would try to find a um, common ground did not with both of their caucus leaders. And so I think it comes down to building relationships. Uh, Governor Kulangoski started out by trying to go bowling with legislators. Uh, Could I you think repeat it, that? Could you, he started off, I'm sorry. By trying to go bowling, bowling. with legislators with legislators, you know, where do you have common ground? Mm -hmm. Legislators like to bowl. Um, and that worked for a while and then evaporated. And you have to be persistent and realize that, yeah, if you bowled together for three months and then a shouting match in the office, that doesn't mean you have to, that you should stop bowling. I mean, you have to play the really, really, really long game. It's, it's like a marriage or anything else. 
you have to be willing not just to go halfway, but to go clear over to the other side and get to know that person. Mm -hmm. And too few people have the understanding or time to do that. And when they do, they often get criticized by their peers. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure if if you were legislator, you would be able to um, to, to change that. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, I I really appreciate your insight. Um, these are complicated issues. Um, I think sometimes they seem intractable, but I think you've given some uh, given us some real food for thought about how we can untract. I don't mean detract, untract them. Uh, I know AUW will do all it can um, to foster collaboration. I know I've. It's been very interesting to me uh, being directly involved with the legislature. Um, being able to talk to a, leg a legislator who disagreed with me. Um, you know, sometimes that went well, sometimes it didn't. But, I, you know, I usually always learn something. So I hope you guys are uh, all enthused and, uh, you know, join the Public Policy Committee. Um, email me about that. And of course, tomorrow, um, you know, we have a number of um, wonderful representatives who are going to be uh, speaking to you. They are uh, younger, shall we say, maybe not in age, but they're, uh, they're newer legislators. Um, and they're not all Democrats. <laughs> they're not all Republicans. Um, but I think uh, all of them have really uh, done what they can to, to foster uh, you know, obviously get what they wish to uh, get uh, accomplished. But I also think uh, to listen, those in case you, you haven't um, already signed up, which I assume you have, we're hearing from Representative Winsley Campos, Senator Akasha Lawrence Spence, Representative Lily Morgan, and Representative Lisa Reynolds. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at seven. Um, thank you for your engaging questions. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. And um, thank you guys for engaging in public policy. Makes me happy. Thank you.